I'll stand up just out of habit, I guess, um, but also because I tend to move around. It's really a pleasure to be here. Oh my God, sorry, uh, <laughs> just a moment. Um, hello, Dr. Know-it-all, oh, it's fantastic that you called me. Look, I'm in the middle of a lecture, can I? Oh no, all right, well look, I've got patients that are really ill. Yeah, it's unsustainability. They, they show all the symptoms. How many? Well, about seven billion and counting. Um, I don't know what to do. C can you give me some suggestions? Um, they should what? Really? You, you're sure? Take, let me see if I got this right. Take 17 SDG pills every morning for the next 11 years and call you in 2030. Ah, okay, okay. Um, well, uh, thank you, I think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Know-it-all. But good luck with your new position in the White House in the um, <laughs> bu Bureau of Simplistic Solutions to Complex Problems. Bye-bye. <laughs> I'll see you in 2030. Um, so um, we have a bit of a problem here. Uh, and it is unsustainable. And it is unsustainability. It isn't uniform across the world, but the solutions are not simple. They are complex, and it's because we are embedded as human beings in a very complex system, social, ecological issues. And I will be careful about one thing. I mean, I'll try to remember to flag it explicitly, but when I talk about social concerns, I'm including cultural value-based belief systems, the whole set of things. Usually I will try to flag that explicitly, but please understand that I mean that in that broader context. So I wanted to start with sort of, from my point of view, overarching goal here. Um, and that is, let me get this out of the way. That is really finding and both finding, identifying, creating pathways towards sustainable futures, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, and moving societies on those pathways. Second, to do that in ways that are appropriate to the culture and context of each region, location, community, whatever, not in some globally averaged way, um, because that simply doesn't work, and it will not work. And do that through finding ways to engage with collective behavior change, or if you will, on a more grandiose level, societal transformation. And at the same time, as this is a matter of attuning this kind of, finding the pathways in different regions, different communities, it means that we also have to find a way to make these globally coherent. So we're not defeating each other. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, have embedded in them serious conflicts that mean it is not a simple matter of just, well, we do each one and then everything's fine, because you can't. So that's sort of the basic point. Now, in terms of the objectives here, and I take this from the brochure, and the, there's some very interesting points here. One of them is that looking for infor evidence-informed decision-making for sustainability, and in order to be able to translate knowledge into action. I'll come back to that. I personally have a big problem with that trope, but we'll get back and to address the relationship and interaction between environmental change and social processes, smaller and larger um, scale social transformation. So with that sort of in the framework, let me try to address it in a couple of different ways. I, the flow of what I'd like to talk about, just so you know kind of what the direction is, one is to talk about imagination in a particular way, in learning from the past 
to understand our present in order to design and imagine, to imagine and design the future. And it's really about changing our expectation from static, saying, well, now we're fine, or we're not fine, but we'll change it, and then it'll be fine, and then we're done. Well, we're not. We're in a situation where this incredible, the hockey stick acceleration of, of uh, Will Steffen and others say that, particularly since the 1950s, but in some cases much longer, or even more recently, things are not only changing, they're accelerating. The rate at which they're changing and the variables that we can see that are changing are also changing, how we measure that. If you think about the advent of our dear little <laughs> object here um, and the effect of social media, clearly there's a, a, a discontinuous jump there in the way we uh, communicate and therefore the impact on the society. The other thing which I probably will not have time to talk about very much but at some point would love to is the question of narrative expressions. Not just long extended narratives which are very important in looking at discourse analysis but the short affective, emotional things of music, of dance, of visual images of sculpture, of puppet shows, that are ways of communicating really critical issues in appropriate to each culture. Um, but they are the way that we communicate sin since humanity was human. Um, the second thing is looking at indicators, and I'm just using those as a proxy to talk about a way that we develop assemblies of ideas. And we, I'm working with a project, and I think some of you may have had a chance to glance at the world in 2050, ch particularly the chapter that Sander van der Leeu and I and a number of colleagues wrote, um, which is the world in 2050 is a joint project between the Stockholm Resilience Center and IASA, the International Institute for Advances advanced systems analysis in, uh, outside Vienna, um, <clears throat> and looking at social transformations and the trajectories from today through 2030, the sustainable development goals to 2050 and beyond. But there are really serious concerns that that raises about social dynamics. So if your baseline is moving all over the place, how do you get a trajectory that means something. And so that was a very interesting process. But it's also indicative of a process that we're really struggling with in both positive and negative ways, which is not just big data, but powerful computing. Big data wouldn't help us, and in fact, we wouldn't be able to collect it, were it not for the fact that we had much more powerful computation devices but also much more powerful algorithms to function with it, but that itself is risky. There are risks involved in both privacy, in access, who gets access, who does not. So there are a number of issues that are stirred up by that. And the third area is interpretation, and I really want to stress that because it's about how we make meaning in order to make meaningful decisions. It's not about sort of just dump the data in. Um, the example I often give is you get a piece of paper with a bunch of lines across it, and it has funny markings on the lines, dots and various things, little flags. And you can take an instrument and you can play every note, which is the data. You're simply reproducing the data well, that's not very interesting music, as we heard so wonderful music last night. It's about the interpretation, and science does precisely the same thing. It tells a story from the data. It's that you don't stop with having told the story. Then you have to try to break the model that you've created by working with others, reproducing the results, but also trying to falsify them. 
So that's the basis of that sense of interpretation. I probably won't have a lot of time to go again into affect, identity, and rationality, but maybe we come back to that later. But I do want to say a little bit about inquiry and experiential learning, because I think that we need to reset our expectations in terms of learning. And I will use the word education in terms of the institutions, but it's both, it's, in, it's learning that occurs throughout our lives. We do most of our learning after school, not in school. We use that as a basis then for going on in our lives. <clears throat> but we don't keep running to the textbook for every issue that comes up. And in many cases, it's not in the textbook. And last, I'll talk, if we have time, hopefully a little bit on boundary objects and games as ways of dealing with conflicted dialogues. Okay, so the, we're starting out with um, evidence-informed decisions for sustainable science, for sustainable futures. I mentioned that I would use, I don't like the term sustainable development because development has lots of problems, as you all know. I like to think of it as sustainable futures, plural, meaning how is that instantiated in different cultures in different regions under different contexts. Working with Inuit people in Barrow, Alaska, or in Greenland, or in Siberia, and, and local residents as well, leads to a very different sense of what the future might be that would be desirable than where my student works in the Kibere slum in Nairobi. I mean, <laughs> it's not the same culture, context, conditions, etc., on many levels. So it comes back then to what is science? If we're using evidence, how do we anal analyze that evidence? How do we use science to our advantage, if you will? And my question, to start out, really simple-minded one, if you will, what's science? Somebody want to take a stab at what the, how they would characterize what is science? Just any, any thoughts that come to mind. I mean, I don't need a formal definition, just your sense of what, how would you describe to your friend or nephew or grandmother what science? Please. Approved knowledge. Very, very, that's an interesting approach. Other thoughts? I thought I heard something over here. Anyone else agree with that? Disagree? Add to it? Understanding. Understanding. Okay. Anything else? Well, let me, let me add to that a little bit. I see science, and this touches on both of you what you've suggested, Science is a social contract which specifies a process by which we collectively make sense of our universe and produce useful knowledge for society. Meaning that it is a social contract. It is about the way we attempt to falsify models that we may create in our minds or formally in paper, on computer, whatever. But in order to be accepted and usable, if you will, if not useful, it has to be something that has been tested, particularly in the sense of trying to break the model. It's not enough to say, oh, I've got a few good examples and now it's, that's fine. It's where are the examples that don't work? It's an assumption that we can understand, that you, the humankind can understand the bird around itself and the future uh, in a rational, that means scientific yes. way, vis-a-vis -vis, um, superstition and other belief systems. So that a kind of, um, you know, Mephiston uh, yes. approach. I, I think that's an important point because, yes. And, and I think that's a very important point. But the other thing with Faust, by the way, which had a huge impact on me as a child, I mean, it's a, teenager was the idea that you never should be stopped, you never should stop learning and being excited about that. Well, we had a set of seminars about quantum physics and, and, um, and, and social sciences, and this is the, the 
assumption is, is questioned now, whether we can really understand. Well, I think the point is, what does really understand? I mean, there, there are many things that one cannot perhaps fully understand or disentangle, or, and I use the word advisedly in a quantum mechanical sense. Um, I did spend a number of years, my first career was doing quantum mechanics and laser physics and chem <coughs> excuse me, chemistry. So I have at least a passing acquaintance with these things. But the, the other side of that is that um, we are all, the, the issue is not what is the reality or the truth, but what's the best approximation we are able to achieve at any given time so that it is useful. It's viable for us. Um, I gave a lecture once in, in Brussels on, a, on a, it was a large hall, a lot of people, <clears throat> and it was on part of developing global system science for policy making. And I said something about the social contract and da da da. And at the end of it, one, one colleague, really angry, got up and said, no, it's about the truth. And I said, oh, yeah? And how the hell do you know? <laughs> and <laughs> we, we, we had some problem after that. Um, <laughs> But I think the point that I want to make in this, and it's an important point, that we do not engage with in education, which is science is normative and inescapably subjective. And people say, what do you mean? No, it's, it's objective. Yes, it is an effort to be objective. But it is inescapably normative and subjective because it involves decisions like, who funds the work? For what purpose? Who benefits or is disadvantaged by the process or the results? Which data is collected or which is ignored? Um, who interprets the data? Critical piece. And who has access to the raw data and the processed results? And so that comes back then if we talk about evidence um, that it's the knowledge that's relevant for answering a question, but it is, can be subjected to the same process. And the main points are that it has to be salient, it has to be relevant to the issue you, you're looking at. It has to be seen as legitimate, and that often applies to who's say, selling the, the goods. Who is it that speaks to this? Is, are they competent, if you will? Is the data valid? Is it collected in a way that uh, assumes that it actually has some validity, and do you believe it? Is it credible? So we always have come back to looking at things in those uh, part, and again, science plays a very important part in that. Um, but there's also this question, how does science engage with different publics, with different cultures, with different environments and contexts? And in that sense, it's very important to figure out, and this is something we are struggling with, but I think moving towards, how do you co-design things with the relevant stakeholders, rights holders, people involved, and how do you co-produce the knowledge by engaging with different kinds of knowledge, different epistemologies, if you will, um, to address problems which are fundamentally social and ecological intertwined. And doing that means working with inter and transdisciplinarity. So it's not just that the civil engineer talks to the electrical engineer, which is the answer I got when I was at Eteha and gave a lecture probably seven or eight years ago. I think it's changed. But that we really struggle to work together across disciplines, which means we also have to learn each other's language. And I don't mean Hungarian and English. <laughs> I mean, you know, what, the medical language, the sociological language, etc. That's really tough. In this Arctic project that Jody mentioned, I had two lawyers, a political scientist, a sociologist, an environmental psychologist, an economist, 
uh, four natural scientists, and trying to learn to talk to each other was really hard. But it, what we did, and, and I think this is worthwhile, we actually began to document our language together as a way to remind ourselves, and also as we brought new members in or people left, we could maintain that sense of language. Um, and I would also say, this comes up often with many of my colleagues, yes, the disciplines, the narrow, deep, expertise and focus of traditional sort of uh, reductionist science is absolutely necessary and will continue to be. But it's not sufficient for these problems. We need to find out how to build across those domains. I will show off, I, I hope you'll excuse me for this, but since it's directly relevant, a book which just came out in January on social transformations of social ecological system based on about six years of work with the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto, in which my project on called Classica, which I'll get to later, um, was sort of the, the conceptual foundation. We looked at about 40 some projects all over the world, but 20 of which were in, are in the book, um, as really an effort to look at how knowledge is constructed in a way that engages the cultural, traditional practices in different communities with the, if you will, global scientific knowledge and makes it functional, useful for, for all. Let me come to indicators. So the world in 2050, as I mentioned, there it, it's a group of really high level, very, very good integrated assessment models. What's an integrated assessment model? Well, it's putting together indications of how we are functioning along different dimensions, meaning that it's um, looking at social dif different social factors, water access, health, et cetera, education and trying to put that together to see what are the trends and where might we go. Well, when they were, the idea was to look at these six factors. I don't need to read them all. I'm sure you can read them. Um, and come up with a set of indicators and look at this going from today to 2030 to 2050 and beyond. Well, Sander van der Leeu, former um, well, founder and former director of the um, School of Sustainability at Arizona State University and, and um, external professor at Santa Fe Institute, and I and probably about six other people started getting really unhappy in this meeting about two years ago and saying, wait a minute, you're telling me that you're going to do this from this platform from today and project out here when, depending on where you're looking at the measurements, things are changing on a daily basis, much less on 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And it took us about a year to convince the uh, big game modelers that, wait a minute, yeah, there is a problem. And that's what led to this chapter two that you may have had a chance to look at. And the point being that now, how do we actually adjust this? for social transformation. How do we understand social transformation? What's that process? To me, that's a very interesting process because it's the, the extension, if you will, of social movements. We know lots about social movements. Civil rights, women's rights, um, labor law, whatever. However, <laughs> All of those are much more easily identified in terms of what your goal is. You know what you want. You want more salary or you want more time off or you want acknowledgement of equal pay for equal work. Fine. It's tough with sustainability. It isn't this nice target right there. It's an evolving target. It's an emergent phenomenon. And so creating a movement around that is tough. I believe it can be done. I believe it has to be done. 
But that's the point of understanding collective behavior change. More on that in a moment. So as we tried to get people to acknowledge in this program, it's about learning from the past to understand where we are now, to reflect on it and understand it, but then also to imagine the future. It's not about, if you will, incrementally pushing things step by step forward. That's one way. But what if we, if we think about that, it's very path dependent. We know what we've been doing. So we kind of do a little more of the same. Well, that's not necessarily going to get us where we want to be or where we need to be. So part of it is, can we imagine a very different future? Can we be creative enough to think of something completely different and, if you will, backcast it so that we get to a different way, a different pathway from where we are to somewhere in the future? And one of the things that I've worked on in a very different project, which I'll maybe touch on at the very end, is the idea of socially mediated creativity. How do we work together? How do we think together so that what Stuart Kaufman, in talking about evolutionary biology, called the adjacent possible, and we kind of stole it with Stuart's help uh, and thought about creativity as a, as a social enterprise rather than, you know, the evil genius in the corner and the, <gasps> Eureka! Well, it don't work that way, sorry. Um, it's very much of a social process. And it's a very wonderful one, but we need to support that and build on that. And from that, there's an emergence of opportunities, but also systemic risk. And we need to look at those as both as emergent properties. Um, and that's also the mechanism both for governance in an adaptive fashion, but also for uh, socially valuable innovation as opposed to market-driven or only market-driven innovation. Um, and, you know, if you think, you know, I used to be in Silicon Valley. I ran a, started and ran a company for 18 years. And I don't admit this usually, but the reason I got thrown out was, number one, I invented the world's slowest, lowest density hard, draw, uh, hard disk. Um, and then I suggested that innovation should be for social benefit, not just for the market. No, I'm kidding. I didn't get thrown out. But um, I could have practically for such things. Um, but the idea also is how to create models, whether system dynamics models, agent-based models, heuristic models, but not because they predict the future. We can't. Uh, Alan Kay, a friend of mine, once made the remark that the best way to predict the future is invent it, um, which I rather like. But short of that, um, the point is models are there to help us think creatively. And in, the, in this kind of situation, it's not about predicting, but it's about looking at emergent, potential emergent phenomena and examples and saying, oh, boy, we hadn't thought about that as a possibility. We better expand our repertoire of thinking. And one of the things that, that I'm doing with the Classica Alliance, which I started about 11, 12 years ago, as part of the International Human Dimensions Program, um, is to understand this knowledge, learning, and societal change, but in particular, trying to understand collective behavior change and to use build models, which we are now doing, that use narrative expressions as insights into the way people, ident number one, imagine the future, their guidance, their incentive to move forward, and at the same time, their identities, social identities, which have a great deal, to, and people have more than one often, but which have a great deal to do with motivation. Do I want to join that in-group? Am I in that in-group, or am I outside, or do I want to stay out? Those kind of things have a large effect, and we are now actually building agent-based models based on that. 
and use that for understanding possible uh, pathways. Part of it is also that we're talking about long-term thinking and that therefore the short-term decisions which have to be there have to be in a strategic framework that acknowledges the long-term concerns and not that we are making short-term decisions with no sense of a strategic goal. Then we're cooked, literally and figuratively. Um, very briefly, and I don't have time to go into this very far, but I mentioned the narratives, and I mean you know, anything from Gilgamesh to Beowulf to the, all the Norse sagas, I mean, and the uh, Indian saga. I mean, there are many, many examples because humans have used this to communicate, but they've used it also as a way of cohering communities. The stories tell you who you are part of, who, what's your culture, and it helps communities cohere has always been that. But it's also, it's not just the long saga, the whole Odyssey or uh, Beowulf or whatever the story is, um, or if you will, King's I Have a Dream speech, which was long, powerful, beautiful, but what people remember is I Have a Dream. That becomes the representation of the whole story. But it's really important because people remember it. It's emotionally effective. I worked in civil rights, in fact, for King's organization during the civil rights era a few centuries ago, it seems. I wish we'd gotten a little further, but OK. But <laughs> under rather difficult circumstances, I'll put it that way, keeping that phrase in mind, literally or just generally in the way I was thinking in the group of us, um, was very important in being able to, uh, to keep persevere under direct physical threat. And I'm sure there are lot, people here have lots of other examples. But it's again this affective expression and not simply the discourse. And it reflects these things of worldviews, identity. It's a matter of goals and desired futures, but also the motivation for action. So let me mention another project. I'm going to jump a little bit here just in, because of time. Um, the Global Sustainability Strategy Forum is a project that we're doing IASS and the Arizona State University, um, Ordwin Wren, director at IASS, myself, and Sander von der Leeu uh, from ASU are, are running this, have organized it. It's a four-year project funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, the requirement is that we have to drive diesels. Um, no, I'm sorry. No. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the point is really to produce guidelines for inclusive policy making. The inclusive is important here. That deals with social values, framing, disparate power, and impact. So when you're in a, any situation, in almost any context, there are people who have economic power, have political power, have knowledge that they can use, and there are people who don't. How do you have dialogues across that? And how do you find pathways that engage it? So we have 14, I would say, very highly qualified world experts from different parts of the world. And though, for better or worse, it's called the Global Sustainability Strategy Forum, it's really about regional and sub-regional uh, coherence, and the question is how different regions, different conditions lead to different pathways, and to make judgment, not simply, again, integrated assessment models, but expert judgment about how these things work together. And so we'll do one, we have one meeting in the first week of March. Uh, we hide every, we sort of lock them up in a tower for five days, and you know, we'll get your food and water, but you better come up with something. Um, actually, we all better come up with something. And then in a couple of years, we will revise that, but we will issue a report in the, at each stage. Um, and it's the, maybe the major focus is on, polariz on, on globalization, 
on digitalization, and much as I don't like the word, but Ortwin picked it up, sustainableization. Is it, can we move it to sustainability? Okay, sorry about the language. Um, I, I have fights about that. Anyway, these three processes and their impact may amplify each other. That is, one of those three may, in a sense, collide or support the other. How do we make that supportive rather than sort of uh, destructive interference? Things like global trade norms can be very important and very helpful, um, but it's also a question then, does that have an impact on ecological well-being or footprint? Um, smart grids, great, wonderful, but does that mean on um, the kind of rebound effect that now we do actually change and in increase in consumption and production? So there, there are a number of different effects that we will try to look at, but the idea is a comprehensive, holistic un understanding of transformations at different spatial scales and at different governance levels. Um, Again, just to say that we're looking at unique systems, if you will, idiosyncratic, but that we're looking at what are common aspects, including culture, um, that come together in some kind of a globally coherent system rather than incoherent. So I want to jump now, last part, um, uh, why do we need a new approach, which I mentioned earlier, in terms of learning? Well, I would say there, there are probably a lot of reasons. And for sake of time, I'm going to jump ahead on this. I, would, I hope we'll have some time to discuss this, but let me sort of present a few thoughts on it. Um, one, I think we need to change expectations in society about what is learning and what is education and what is science. Um, because we're, in a sense, hampering ourselves because we're working with the same expectations across society that have been there since 19th century, basically, and we keep reinforcing that. And it's only when, when people, let's say, get into graduate school, we say, oh, by the way, it's a little more complicated than that. Maybe you should rethink this. Well, that's too late, because number one, you exclude people we want in the pipeline. We want them engaged who are interested in addressing problems that they're, they're seeing in their own communities, but also we change the expectation of how you should learn. So I would say the absolutely first part that has to be there is stimulating curiosity. It's not about the answers. Who gives a damn about the answers? I mean, here, I'll, I'll find a nice big thick uh, uh, encyclopedia, hand it to you and say, it's really interesting, just read that. Well, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and we know what's, what happens. And we do this all the time in classes. Just learn this stuff. Well, that doesn't work very well, but if you start with the questions, that is that, that the learner has, learner-centered thinking, then the story gets very different. And I will show you examples in a minute. The other thing is that I see these inquiry and experiential, and particularly in terms of the experiential, it's really about a building of vocabulary for thinking. So you, you begin to acquire experience with different things. And it begins to give you, not necessarily all consciously, but at some level, a set of experiences that you can sort of match patterns. I mean, thinking about how music works, it's about pattern recognition. Not only, but it is that also. You need to recognize the relationship between notes, let's say. You need to recognize how people relate to one another. You need to recognize the relationship between the political and the social, or whatever. And that comes from these set of experiences. And they may be explicit, but in many cases, as young children demonstrate to us all the time, we don't teach them to recognize, you know, whose mom, mother, whose father, who's the uncle, et cetera. They get that really quickly. Um, and they get language the same way. 
So we need to build that vocabulary for thinking and hopefully thinking also creatively. I would say also we make the sad mistake which deprives a lot of, I think, of the fun of a lot of this. We teach with the results of the models. We don't teach with the models. We say, this is the answer. Where did it come from? You know, it, 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 the whole point is science is not revelatory. It's about the way we have probed the world around us and, may, and recognized some patterns, created knowledge out of that, as we talked about earlier. And I would say also trying to create safe, and I'll say what I mean, but culturally transcendent experiences. Things that are not culturally specific, though that also is doable and important, but creating things that are safe in the sense that one can fail. One can do experiments and it doesn't work. Oh, okay, so now what do I do? Well, try something else. And making that part of the thinking, because if you're too afraid to make a mistake, you don't do anything interesting. I can unfortunately attest to that all too well. Um, but also finding ways to stimulate dialogue in conflicted and difficult complex social issues through boundary objects, and I'll come back to that. Um, and one of the ways is that I've engaged with for some time, um, starting, I, I was doing fundamental research, I was at Stanford, I got an offer to run a science museum in San Francisco with Frank Oppenheimer, the brother of Jay Robert, who ran the Manhattan Project. Um, you have your own Manhattan Project here, I know. Um, this was unfortunately quite different. Um, but I ended up running a science museum, and out of that, then I was in Silicon Valley and teaching at Stanford, doing research, and, and ended up leaving, starting a company designing learning environments, about invented basically about 200 devices in 230 museums around the world, Smithsonian, Disney, NASA, whatever. And so out of that began to really wonder about how these things work and what makes sense here. And again, inspiring and nurturing curiosity, using games as boundary objects for mutual learning between people engaged. And often that's a very important thing because it takes an issue and in a sense puts it sort of concretely on the table where everybody sees what you're doing and you're talking about that as opposed to arguing with the person who put it there. Doesn't always work, but in a number of cases I can t tell you about did work. Um, and design games that engage with a wide range of age and culture and, uh, that evoke empathy because you're engaging with others and there's more that I could say about that. That's something I think is important that we try to develop. And very importantly, not only f be willing to risk failing, but also to seek automatically multiple solutions, not the optimal technocratic solution. Sometimes that works. But in many cases, that's the so source of failure we get a good technocratic answer, but it doesn't work in the society or it doesn't work under other conditions than the one it was designed for. Too many examples of that. And out of that, to, become, to encourage people to become more reflexive. So let me, um, let me jump into fun stuff. Let's see, I don't know if we, can we kill the lights a little bit on this or is that because of the recording, is that a problem? Um, it just would be nice if you could see the image. That's better. Great. Thank you. Um, this is a very simple thing with just a transparent box. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Transparent box, which is sealed on the sides and bottom and dry ice in it, open on the top. I don't know if you can see these kids' faces, but it's sort of... <laughs> um, 
But the same box, I mean, it's the same experiment, but in slightly different physical configuration. These women and this man in, in Beijing, adults, Chinese, not Americans in Philadelphia, um, same reaction, exactly. And the point is not what teaching pieces of science. It's about actually doing a process of science with them. And the point is that, the, that it is so surprising, cognitive dissonance, if you will, safe cognitive dissonance, that everybody sort of, what's going on? How's that happen? And then people automatically make models, mental models. And then I say, well, OK, so what do you think is going on? And very often, the first thing that happens in this box is that you blow a soap bubble out here. You know what happens. It falls to the floor. You blow it in the top of the box, and it stops. And it sits there. Wait a minute. <laughs> There's nothing in the box. What's it doing? Well, so then kids will say, well, you blew it with your hot air, of which obviously I have plenty. Um, and therefore, they think of the model is a hot air balloon. Really good idea. So how can I test that? And eventually, having done this hundreds of times in, I don't know, 20 countries, they'll come up with, oh, blow it with cold air. OK. So I've got a little squeeze bulb. I do that, it still floats. Oh, OK. So nature doesn't agree with your model. What, what else could we come up with? Eventually, we end up. I fill a, a balloon with um, carbon dioxide from dry ice in a soda bottle. And then we have a balloon race. One with air, one with carbon dioxide. The one with carbon dioxide goes flunk. The one with air behaves normally. And immediately, without my telling, I don't answer any questions. They immediately say, oh, it's heavier. Well, yes, and it's also denser because I made the balloons the same volume. So it's exploring that. And then it turns out that the bubbles change color, change size, and some of them end up on the bottom frozen. And you don't usually see, number one, a frozen bubble, but even a half a bubble frozen. So that tends to get people engaged, because that's the point at which the real learning and dialogue begins because then they're really engaged in trying to find out what's going on. So another example is ping pong pinball. And I think you can see the, some of the kids' faces here. This is in a housing, um, in a um, community center in the housing area in Chicago. I had to move this. I had to take it back and, and had a little truck outside. And I picked this thing up, and they wouldn't stop playing with it. I mean, literally, I'm walking out the door with this thing, and they're sitting there cranking away. You crank 15 seconds with that. You make hydrogen and oxygen out of water in a very simple apparatus. Here's the crank. You have two electrodes at the bottom. Here's just the water level. You open the valve. The gas, oxygen, hydrogen go under the ping pong ball. You make a spark with an oven igniter. You fire the thing 15 meters in the air. Again, it tends to get people's attention. Um, but then the point is, wait a minute, how's that work? And then they're taking what's also important is that these are all designed to be socially engaging. So kids are working together, or adults. And so then there's a discussion, wait a minute, how'd you do that? I turned it the other way. Now they've revert. What's going on? So. And this is a group of teachers in Nanning, China, if I, China, if I remember correctly. Um, it's a way of really engaging and then opening this to questions. But it's also about, so here you have a system which is clean fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. When you're done, you have a tiny bit of water vapor left, nothing else. It's about work, power, and energy fundamental ideas if we're talking about energy trend, energy um, transition and changing energy sources. Um, and it's about a clean fuel. Very briefly, this is a toy that was actually a small version of an exhibit. But what I love is that here's this group of 
girls who came up from a wedding in, in New Delhi and some boys were playing with the toy. This is a toy I built, God knows when, a long time ago. I mean, we actually produced, I don't know, 50,000 of them that were sold to a company, but this is my original prototype. So they're playing with, they took it away from the boys. They weren't gonna give it back. Um, finally, they did give it back to me after a little persuasion, um, but it was their discussion as, as with these kids here in a kindergarten in the US, they're sort of talking to each other, except he's doing it on his own. And this gentleman is sort of playing with it until the director of the institute where I am, Klaus Tupfer, looked, you know, said, Paul, would you please sit down? We have to start the session again. He said, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to try something. This is Paul Crutzen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for his work on the atmospheric ozone. Um, so it works across cultures, works across ages, because it's about the questions. There's something else important, and that is the beauty. And that, that transcends culture in many ways. It's simply a beautiful phenomenon. The package is nothing. That's not important. It's that the system itself is beautiful. Another example of that, and I won't take long on this, is the flow tunnel, which is a large version of one of those toys where you just get these incredibly beautiful patterns. You can manipulate these objects with magnets. It's about three meters across. Um, move objects with magnets. You could show this, for example, these two slides. All I've done is move this green thing down in line with this, and all of a sudden the whole turbulent wake is gone. Streamlining. But you get to play with it. And how far apart can it be? Can it be angled a little bit, what if I put this in the back? So what if experiments safely? You can try all you want. There are no instructions. There's some commentary, but people don't read that. Or in fact, I never wanted to build an exhibit that people had to read first. If they had to read it, forget it. That's not the way it's gonna work. But here you see again the social interaction. Mothers and daughters in Santiago, Chile in Mirador, the science center there. And it's the, the interaction between them and the discussion that really is rich. One or two more, two more things. One is the um, energy transition truck that Ordwin Wren and I designed, which now, as I just heard recently, it's just been closed, but it ran with 700,000 people. And in it, there were a set of exhibits that I designed around the outside, including the ping pong pinball, on energy production, on storage, on transmission, and on environmental impact or ecological impact sustainability. But in the middle was a game with little iPads, and you, had to, you played for four minutes. You, a random group of people or a school group or whatever you start out and you say, okay, we're gonna be politically correct, we're gonna have 80% renewable and 20% coal. Cool, great, wonderful. So you start the game and you see, you know, a little like SimCity thing with your house and whatever, and you have to do the dishes and you have to uh, take care of the laundry which starts to pile up and you have to put food in the, ref in the freezer and turn the lights on and off, and you play for a week, which is four minutes in virtual time, and there's a little, that all would be really boring. There's a little glitch. At the end of the table, at each end, is a hand crank generator that's producing the electricity, literally, for the game. Well, what happens if everybody does the laundry at the same time and turns on the lights? The poor fool who's on the renewable end, if it's, if it's a dark, it's at night, you turned on lights, you're doing your laundry, you came home, whatever. The only source of power is now the coal. And the, literally, you cannot turn the crank, the torque is too high to turn, and you get a blackout. And then people say, wait a minute, what happened? What, 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 what's wrong? And then you start a discussion. And then you can play again, but where you have a 15 second advance warning when somebody's about to do laundry or whatever, 
and then you've shaved the power peak, and it's entirely doable. Simple thing, but we did studies with people, and virtually everybody remembered that. That was the memorable thing. And again, it's not that that provides a ton of answers. It doesn't. But it opens up the dialogue, and it makes it memorable, makes it part of your thinking. The last game and last thing that I want to talk about is something I call gaming the future, with slight tongue-in-cheek with puns, but intended. And sorry for the very crude diagram, but here's a big Lego board. This is a project based, started from a project from the, Lem, uh, from the Lego Foundation and Templeton Foundation. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and you make a, a landscape. And I mean, here's just a thing. So there's a river, there's a power, hydroelectric power supply, there's a factory here, there's a city here, there are roads, there's agricultural fields, da 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 da. Whatever you, I mean, it could be in different forms. Well, we actually built, or I shouldn't say we, the group at, and in La Sapienza in Rome, Vittorio Loretta's group uh, in the physics department, built this wonderful prototype that we tested in September 2017. Um, we had funding, as I said, from Templeton and uh, Lego foundations. And people are building these things. You can sort of see it here. It's not very clear. But overhead are the prototype. It's not exactly as I want it. The point is, if I make a move on the Lego board, I, I decide I'm going to build another high rise here. And you know, then, OK, so and so many people, and I can indicate that in the program as I do that. You know, if it's just Legos, who cares? I mean, you can build whatever you want. But in this case, there are two satellites watching this in geosynchronous orbit. In other words, two television, two video cameras um, looking at Earth system resources, right? That's how we do it, and one of the ways we do it. And what you see is not just the table, but you see the CO2 output, the air pollution, the river volume, the river pollution, the uh, traffic density, the people density, per, population density, a, a whole bunch of things you can see. Now, <coughs> the point is this is a simple way to introduce complexity because you make what seems like a simple gesture, but it has consequences that may be dispersed in time and space. One last big step is we are now talking with the, I've been talking with the Association of Science Technology Centers in Washington, which is about 800 science museums, aquaria, zoos, et cetera, all over the world. Imagine now we have this Lego table here in Kusek, but there's another one in Mumbai, and one in Tokyo, and one in New York. Now, my river runs into the one in, in Mumbai, and my power is connected to the New York power grid. Well, now I get a, a Skype call from Mumbai and say, what are you guys doing? This is polluted as hell. It, we get no volume. You got to fix this. I said, well, look, our problem is that we're not getting any power from New York. Now you can begin a dialogue, literally in space and time, <laughs> to look at what the consequences of complexity really are in this. It's, it's not a complicated model, it's a simple model, but it illustrates the ideas in a rather simple, memorable, fun, playful way that you can experiment with. So let me go to the last slide. Um, hello. There we go. Let me just go to a few more questions for you. Is your work important for society? Is the society important for your work? Will your work help your generation? Will it help future generations? 
And very importantly, whoops, yeah. What do you care most about in your own work? What is really the driver for you in this? And I ask those questions both as rhetorical for you to think about, but also because I feel that I've been incredibly lucky through my life and my careers, all three of them, um, that I've worked on things that I deeply love doing. And I have, you know, going from laser physics and chemistry, fundamental research, designing new systems for that, for medicine and, and environment, to running this company and designing things for learning all over the world, to becoming a sociology professor and trying to understand social science in order to understand these kinds of questions for myself, but also the privilege of working with people like all of you who care about this. That's a fantastic privilege. So let me end there, sort of. Is that the end? Well, not really, because I hope we're only in the initial steps of moving towards sustainable futures. Thank you.